following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with Michigan State University. Welcome to Spartan Sagas, I'm Jim Peck. The people you're about to meet have at least two things in common. They are all working to make a change in the world, and they are all Spartans. Gabrielle Kleber found that a great way to see the world is through garbage. Her important lessons show us that trashing the water is actually trashing the planet. I was given a grant by the Circumnavigators Club, which is an organization, an international organization, uh, that's devoted to global unity. The members pick one or a handful of university students each year to go around the world and study some sort of global topic with the goal to promote global unity. Um, and so my proposal was to study marine debris and get a global view on ocean pollution and its impacts and where it is in the world and um, how the governments and other organizations are handling it. So what I did is I independently planned and executed a three-month around the world trip where I visited seven different countries. I was in Hawaii, Australia, the Maldives, South Africa, England, Wales, and Iceland. At each of these locations, I was cleaning beaches, but also speaking to locals, uh, local experts, local residents, about the issue and how it impacted uh, their environment, their socioeconomic impacts. We're on Sandy Hook, which is at the northern tip of New Jersey. Um, the bay side uh, of Sandy Hook is the side that all the trash from Manhattan and all of New York City comes to. Primarily when I first started, my goal was to get an idea of the volume, composition, source, and impacts of marine debris at each location that I went to. And as I started traveling, it really turned more into a social issue, uh, surprisingly enough. And I was really looking into how uh, the people at each location were affected, and the cultures, um, and the economy, along with the environment. I run into things all the time like this in different countries that I was running, going to. Um, I'd always run into people fishing, doing different activities on the beaches. Uh, so this was really common. This was kind of a flashback to my trip. By the end of the summer, I picked up 72,000 pieces of trash. Uh, that sounds like a high number, but it really does not put a dent at all into the, the world's ocean pollution problem, and I understand that. And that wasn't necessarily my goal. I had a few goals in mind. Um, one was to kind of understand where the trash was coming from and just to get kind of a global view because there had been very few studies globally on marine debris. So I think I was one of the first in that sense. And I think it's, a, it's important that we, since all of our oceans are in connect, interconnected, it's really important that we get a global view on it so we can see where these items are coming from and maybe hit it at the source. Um, and then also, ultimately, my goal was to just raise global awareness and I really think I, I successfully did that at each of the locations I went to. I was very active within communities. Uh, in various countries, I pulled together uh, school groups to help me clean the beach. I joined local community groups that were cleaning the beach. I talked to lots of local residents. Uh, so I really just got out there and spread the word on the issue. People don't understand what happens when they throw something in the ocean. I spoke with a lot of people in the fishing industry while I was traveling, and they all said the same thing, that it's just, they're just tossing it into an abyss. They don't realize how connected everything is, that uh, they say an item thrown overboard in Japan can make it around the world in six years. I've been a very fortunate person. I've had so many opportunities and so many experiences at such a young age that I would love if someone would look at that and want to be that, just because I think it's important that people get out and see the world and do these things and be proactive. So if, if I can pass that on to someone, that would be wonderful. Two biggest things is take opportunities as they come and take risks. You've got you to gotta do both of those things. Uh, you can't just let opportunities go because they're, they're not going to come back. You've got to jump on them. And take risks. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary is easy, uh, but it's almost always worth it. 
This presentation has been brought to you by Michigan State University, America's premier land-grant institution. 150 years of advancing knowledge, transforming lives. The day we created a cancer drug that saved millions of lives began like any other day. And when we developed a new way to purify the world's water supplies, it might have been a Tuesday or possibly a Thursday. And whether it's alternative energy or better food safety, the next time we help create a solution to one of the world's great problems, we'll be proud. Then we'll get back to work. Michigan State University. Spartans will. Bill Wank is trying to build a better world by building better drains. He's always loved the land and creates harmony during the storm. I wanted to redesign the storm drain, which is that thing in the street that everyone ignores except when it doesn't work. You know, it's where the storm water goes. And that sort of lowly element that is literally everywhere in the city that is ubiquitous. That, and it's really a metaphor for rethinking how we treat urban water so that it's no longer a waste. It becomes a resource. It becomes part of our daily lives in a way that we, we seek it out, that we welcome it. I think that is really kind of, it's profound to me in that if we can rethink a framework of the city in a way that it creates a garden, even though we don't call it a garden, then I think we've succeeded as a profession. We designed public landscapes that have a strong environmental focus that deals with urban water resources in a number of creative ways in a way that is really beneficial to the public in that we create open space, habitat, trail corridors, parks, things like that, so that people can enjoy public funds that not only solve the problems, but that create those sorts of public amenities. I grew up in southern Michigan on a farm, very small farm, near the town of Chelsea, um, and really, kind of graduated from high school believing I wanted to be a farmer, but intrigued with what my vocational agriculture teacher described as landscape architecture. So I took an introductory class in landscape architecture and never looked back, really, because it, it combined my interest in, in the land, in environmental issues, which I really weren't described as, as such back then in the mid-60s, and really brought them all together. Art was interesting, so that sort of combination fit my interests, or what I was intrigued with, anyhow. Most cities are spending tens of billions of dollars retrofitting their, their storm sewer systems to deal with pollution. So these are enormous public investments and what we're saying, and a lot of cities are really, I think, trying very hard to innovate and do things in creative ways to make sure that that public investment really garners as much benefit to the community as it can, but it's billions of dollars. City councils are now saying, we don't want any more big pipes. What can you do? And we're looking at some cities and how they can solve their problems with stormwater, not just for a very localized area, but for the entire uh, metropolitan area. So that's pretty exciting, pretty encouraging, when you can think systemically. It gets back to that notion of the storm drain. It's not a drain, it's a system. It be, and it becomes a landscape that I think is very meaningful to us, wherever, the collective us, the, 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 to the societies that we live in. I guess I never thought I'd end up here thinking about these things. And you just wonder, how did this happen? <laughs> how did I end up here at this sort of point in, in thinking about the world um, at that scale, where you believe you can influence how billions of dollars are spent and how it's the right thing to do? Maybe it's just that certainty and everybody else ought to know it. <laughs> Michelle Payne Knoper stands up for farmers and ranchers. Her passion is giving sometimes quiet people a loud voice. 
The drive for agriculture that I have comes from the family farm that I grew up on and it also comes from losing that family farm and the, the pain that is associated with that. You're ready for some action and please welcome a passionate champion for agriculture, Michelle Payne. I work as a professional speaker and my goal in life is to connect the farm gate and consumer plate. And what that means is basically being able to bring some common sense to food and help farmers be able to communicate about what they do today. I travel internationally, primarily across North America, but I do love international work as well. The reality is in the United States is that 98.5% of the population is not on a farm. A farm today does look very different than it did 20 years ago. That doesn't mean that the people are any different. It just means that everything has progressed in the agri-food business just as it has in medicine and technology and other arenas in life. I strongly urge people to actually get on a farm and talk to the farmers if you want to know what's happening with your food production. Um, when you look at studies across the United States now, Typically people are two to three or even four generations removed from a farm. You would probably find that these people work extraordinarily hard and have a work ethic unlike any other segment of the population today. You will find uh, very few entrepreneurs like you find in agriculture. Uh, one, they have to be creative and secondly, people that farm manage far more risks and assets than what most people could imagine is even possible. Um, so really when you step back and you look at the culture in America and the sense of freedom and the entrepreneurship, American agriculture represents that at, at its heart and soul in my opinion. Test one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three. As a professional speaker, I certainly have done a, a lot of work to try to develop my skill sets, but more importantly to me is really about connecting with people and understanding what their needs are. Not just people in agriculture that I serve, but also what consumers are interested in. Uh, so the way that I, I went from being an advocate to um, teaching people to do that was primarily through experience and just being able to reach out as an educator and trying to have the professional skill sets in order to do that most effectively farmers do get social media, they do get how to use it. Uh, we're continuing the outreach work to help more and more understand that, but technology is a huge part of the farm, whether it's a smartphone or whether it's biotechnology. The reality is, is that farmers are not outspoken. So what I really do is one, to try to help farmers speak out more effectively and to be able to help people understand where their food comes from. I fell in love with Michigan State when I was 12 years old and I was at 4-H Exploration Days and I deepened my love affair with every FFA convention that I attended. I'm not sure that I'll ever forget standing on the stage at the Municipal Auditorium as an FFA member, um, a freshman that had actually competed in the Green Hen Speaking Contest and that was the day that I knew I wanted to be a professional speaker someday. So I, I have wonderful memories at Michigan State um, from a very young age. I met my husband there as a student. We're both very proud alums of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Michigan State really teaches you about perseverance and following your passion. My passion is agriculture. My passion is being able to help people understand where their food comes from and the wonderful people on the other side of the food plate that are called farmers. Farming's a great job to have. There are few places that you will ever find that are a better place to raise a family. My husband and I are very proud to raise our daughter on a, a family farm, albeit a small family farm. So our barn is very proudly green and white, and we made sure that it was very close to the dark green Michigan State, and our house is also um, quite green and white as well. So we're very proud Spartans, and we wear it outside the house as well as inside, which of course all of our friends love here in Indiana. They like to say it's 4-H colors, but it's not. It's Michigan State colors. Conrad Gelpke is trying to unlock the mysteries of the universe. He's a curious man who reaches for the stars and beyond. The key issue which we're dealing with in the laboratory is uh, finding ways to produce and study rare isotopes. Rare isotopes are species of atomic nuclei which normally don't exist on Earth because they only live for a very short second, sometimes less than a hundredth of a second. Uh, but they nevertheless play a very important role in the evolution of the universe, how stars are cooking up the elements of which the Earth is made. So they, they are a key issue in understanding uh, 
the basic properties of matter in the universe. If you look at the history how mankind and science evolved, uh, you always find that uh, at the beginning, most of the time at least, uh, there were some curious scientists who just wanted to understand how nature works. And then once they unraveled uh, the, the laws of nature, or some, you can call it facetiously the secrets of nature, uh, then of course they, they could think about uh, applications, or other people could think about applications. There are many applications in, in nuclear physics. Uh, nuclear medicine is a huge business in treating cancer. Energy, nuclear energy is a very important aspect, uh, especially since nuclear energy does not create greenhouse gases, so it is becoming more and more important as we are realizing we're heating our planet with uh, too much carbon dioxide emissions. What is important is that we are that we're doing something which is unique and world class. Okay, that 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 resonates with me well. Uh, if you talk about scientific enterprise, there is a relentless endeavor to be the best uh, in virtually anything we want to do. Okay, and and. Mediocrity is not tolerated. Uh, I ask a lot for, uh, from my collaborators and from my colleagues. Okay, we are pushing the envelope extremely hard. Okay, and people are working very hard. They're applying themselves very, very hard. In general, it is very painstaking, uh, sometimes tedious, and sometimes you're, you're sort of stressing your mind to the limits of what you can actually do. Yet, at the same time, when hundreds of scientists are doing this, some of the discoveries will be forgotten, some of them will archive, be archived, and some of them will be breakthroughs. Before you start the process, you really don't know it. Otherwise, everybody would just focus on the breakthroughs. When I came to Michigan State University, uh, I, gave, I wanted to give it a trial. I really didn't know how well it would work out. In terms of the science, I told the director that um, I probably will be done within four years of all of what of I could think about doing at, at the facility. Um, that was um, 33 years ago. I thought that things could happen much, much faster than they really do in life. I always feel we're, we're driven by the sense of discovery. A lot of things which are difficult, which you try to undertake, if you would have known all the difficulties that lie ahead, you probably wouldn't have dared to take them on. I always tell people it's a lot of fun what we're doing. And I never tell them about all the sleepless nights which you're suffering through when you agonize whether your decisions are right, whether you're pushing your people too hard, whether you're taking uh, undue risks. Uh, you don't know whether you're successful. The art of moving things forward is realizing what you can do and not going so far that at the end you will fail and not do anything. The work will stand on its own. I, I think a lot of this will will enter the textbooks. Perhaps the people who did the work will not be remembered for long, but the facts and the knowledge we created, I think that will go into, into the textbooks of mankind. Somebody asked me a different question. Uh, are you satisfied? And I said, that is a question which is really not in my vocabulary very much. What is much more important, I'm always asking, what's the next step? Okay, and when I've done that step, Actually, sometimes I get depressed because it's done, okay, what's, what's there to do? So you have to think about what else can we do, okay? So you always have to be pushing the envelope. And I sure hope that uh, I continue to do this until I say, all right, I've done enough, okay, and then I will disappear in the sunset and, and do my own things in my private life, which nobody has to worry about then anymore. This presentation has been brought to you by Michigan State University, America's premier land-grant institution. 150 years of advancing knowledge, transforming lives. Dr. Stephen Warren knows the secret to who we are is in our genes. Part detective, part explorer, his search is to save our children. I do medical research. I'm a human geneticist and uh, we're interested in variation in the genome that can influence uh, health and disease. And specifically what we've worked on for many years is a form of autism called Fragile X syndrome, where we uh, identified the gene responsible for that disorder back in 1991, and we've been working on that since then. And these are children and adults with learning disability, developmental delay, and you know, in the past they might have been called mentally retarded.
the, the disorder went kind of unrecognized for many years because these uh, children don't look very different than normal kids. Parents notice first, they have concerns about uh, delay in uh, speaking language. So usually around age three is when they first start uh, seeking uh, help or telling their pediatrician that something may be wrong. So back in 1991, uh, we discovered the gene responsible for Fragile X syndrome. And so in the last almost 20 years now, we've understood uh, quite a bit about this, uh, this syndrome, way down to the, what's going on in the nerve cells. And that's led to some approaches now for therapeutics, drugs that may be beneficial. If one's looking to intervene in a genetic disease, uh, something drug-based is the most logical approach. I get a lot of calls from physicians all around the world when they have an unusual case. They don't quite know from reading the literature what to make of it, what to tell the parents. So they'll call me to get my opinion. Families a lot of times want to know just what is new, what looks like promising research on the horizon. And then I think it just gives them hope that there are people working on the disorder that uh, may eventually lead to some therapeutic uh, benefit. And so the work goes on. We're still, there's a lot we still don't fully understand, but you know, we're now more directed at uh, translational research where we're trying to take what we've learned in the last two decades and really think deeply about how can we come up with uh, small molecules that might form a drug that might be useful. I think that uh, you know, if you have a successful career in science, it's very satisfying because you, uh, you know, learn something that uh, no one knew before. And from that point on, people know about it. That's kind of the basis of uh, discovery. You don't discover things every day, that's for sure, but uh, when you do, it's a lot of fun. I'm Jim Peck, thanks for being with us. And remember, Spartans will. Michigan State University, in association with the